Hello, and welcome to Exploring Global Problems, a podcast where we talk to academics from Swansea University whose groundbreaking research is tackling global challenges from health innovation to sustainable futures and the environment, from digital technologies to clean energy. My name is Sam Blacksland, and today I'm joined by Tom Patoka, a professor in human and health sciences and a consultant plastic surgeon. His research explores the issue of burn injuries, specifically improving care and prevention in conflict environments and poorer parts of the world. He is also a keen motorcyclist and has ridden from Nepal to Bangladesh to raise funds for and awareness of the issue of burns. Professor Tom Tucker, um, welcome to Exploring Global Challenges. It's very uh, good to see you. Good morning. Thank you. To start us off, uh, just for people who obviously aren't aware, can you just give us a brief overview of what your work and your research is about? Yeah. So it's really a very broad uh, area and our, our real aim is to answer the question, how do we improve both burn care and prevention in specifically some of the poorest areas of the world? Um, so to address this question, we need to take a very uh, systematic approach, but look beyond just what most people think would be just clinical care, looking after patients and are there new treatments or new drugs or new dressings, etc. That's not actually what we do, because in order to improve the situation and eventually and hopefully the, the outcomes for patients, we need to look at the, the whole system. And that means looking at why patients, why people, individuals get injured in the first place, what causes those burn injuries, how they happen. Then through to their initial treatment, so the first aid they get, transport to hospital, pre-hospital care, and then the care that they get within a burn service or, or general health service, and then their rehabilitation, their aftercare, their psychosocial rehabilitation, reintegration back into society, etc. And this obviously has a an economic effect as well on on both the health system, but also the the, the patients, their their families, friends, etc. It can have an effect on on employment and education. So whilst a burn injury sounds quite an isolated thing. It actually has a, a significant impact across a, a, wild, uh, a wide uh, area. So our aim really is to, that, that that's the question, how do we reduce the number of injuries and improve the outcomes for patients and taking this very wide system approach, looking at all areas? Yeah, you say wide, it sounds very holistic to me. It's everything imaginable to do with the problem. Yeah. And I think this is, I mean, this is really based on on a lot of previous work from the World Health Organization, for example, that looks at systems building and um, and how this can help address some of these issues. Um, that doesn't mean, of course, that doing, you know, specific programs of research to look at new drugs, et cetera, is not, is not valid. Of course it is. But um, really, if you want to have the biggest impact for the most people, and this is specifically in, in the low resource and difficult environment. So we're very lucky in higher income countries that are well resourced. We actually have a limited number of burn injuries and those that are unfortunate to sustain an injury in general get very good outcomes. Um, unfortunately, that is absolutely not the case in in most of the world, in fact. Well, there's about five or six things I already want to pick up on there, and I will do as we go through having our discussion. But first, um, let's just talk about you um, and how you came to, to be here. Um, why the issue of burn trauma and what's your career background? Um, so... Well, briefly, if we go back to school, um, I went to school and, and I do recall back in, this would be back in the mid 70s, probably. <laughs> um, I saw a documentary on television about uh, Médecins Sans Frontières working in, in Vietnam with boat people. And that sort of sparked my interest, to be honest. I, I thought, well, that looks very interesting. Anyway, I, I carried on through school. I ended up going to medical school. In medical school, I got increasingly interested in in kind of global affairs. So not just from a medical point of view, but but all around in terms of international relations, politics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, after medical school, I did a diploma in tropical medicine and hygiene, which was a, a fascinating three month program and introduced a lot of um, very interesting topics around global health issues and how they interrelate with with politics, with with resources, with health economics, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I uh, started work. Well, I did a few of my sort of what's called house jobs and uh, some junior doctor posts. And then I worked for Médecins Sans Frontières. Um, and over the course of the years, I worked for them in, in Cambodia, in Bosnia, in Rwanda and Tajikistan. 
Um, and whilst doing some of that work, I decided that I, I needed to focus my medical career a bit more. Um, and I went to South Africa to do surgery. And I trained in, in Baragwanath Hospital, which is one of the biggest trauma centers in the world. Um, and then after that, sort of focusing in on trauma, I I realized that a lot of trauma care was was actually based around what is now called plastic surgery. And the roots of plastic surgery actually all come out of war surgery from the First and Second World War. Um, so I, I moved towards from more general surgery towards plastic and reconstructive surgery. Um, and then within that area of plastic surgery, um, which a lot of people, of course, consider is is you know cosmetic surgery and beautification etc cetera, etc cetera, and private practice well that wasn't my um, my sort of field or my idea at all so uh within plastic surgery i guess burns is a little bit of um the the area that people are not so much interested in it's it's a, a problem that tends to affect poorer people in whichever society you're in yes um and but it also covers every age group from from you know neonates through to octogenarians, um, and from it covers a lot of you have surgery, but you also have critical care. You have um, you have a lot of sort of physiology to deal with. So it's a very broad area as well, and it 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 does relate to social injustices, etc. So all those things together sort of brought me towards specialising into into burn care then. Um, and that's that's what I then did. Can I just ask a very quick uh, question about yep. plastic surgery? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think a lot of us think we know what that involves and what it is, but we probably don't. What What is plastic surgery? So, yeah, I think there's a lot of misperceptions about plastic mm. surgery. And say, if you if you ask somebody on the street, they'll they'll probably, you know, you know what they'll start to yeah, think of. Yeah. Um, but actually, plastic surgery, it's based around a, a technique rather than rather than a, 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 phys, a, a specific part of the body. So, for example, orthopaedics deals with, with bones. Um, ophthalmology deals with eyes. Um, neurosurgery deals with the brain and nerves. But plastic surgery is, is more around technique. So we deal with all parts of the body. Um, and a lot of the work is around repair and reconstruction. So we cover everything from um, cleft lip and palate and congenital defects to hand surgery, to breast reconstruction, to managing chronic wounds, to lower limb trauma um, and, and uh, head and neck surgery, lots of skin cancer surgery and, of course, burn surgery. And what a lot of people don't realise, for example, so I was a, a consultant plastic surgeon here at, uh, in Swansea at the Welsh Centre for Burns and Plastic Surgery for 13, 14 years. And uh, out of hours, for example, we are the busiest users of emergency theatre. And a lot of people think, what on earth is that about? You know, you're doing emergency facelifts or something. And of course we're not. Sure. <laughs> that's not something that's done in the in the health service. But we do do a huge amount of trauma. So most of the hand injuries, a lot of lower limb injuries, facial injuries, we deal with with all those as well. So I say the roots come out of, of repair and reconstruction from traumatically inflicted wounds is, is the, the sort of origins really. And without being too gory for anybody listening, when we think about burns, I think most of us know that there are categories mm -hmm. of burns. Yep. Can you run us through that? And can you maybe talk to us about how some of the worst cases are sustained? What, how do people get burns? And I know that must differ from place to place and from country to country in particular. Yeah. So, I mean, that's a very important issue because burns does cover a, a huge range. And again, if you ask most people in the street or, or most of your friends or family, everyone will have had a burn injury. And that is often just, you know, from perhaps touching the front of the, the oven or a bit of hot water or something or candle, these kind of things. So a burn can be quite minor. Um, and really it's graded according to, without going into too much detail, but it's around how much of your, your body gets burnt in terms of the, the percentage. So, you know, if you're burnt from head to foot completely, that would be a hundred percent. If it's half that, it would be 50%. And on the, the depth of the burn, and that is a critical thing. So sunburn is a type of burn and, you know, we all know what that's like and it's pretty painful, but it tends to, your skin goes red and it may be a bit flaky after a few days, but there's no long-term um, uh, scarring or anything. Then you get slightly deeper burns, which because they penetrate deeper into the skin, they take longer to heal. 
Um, and as you get further down into the skin, you end up then with a, a full thickness burn, which burns all of the skin. And those take much, much longer to heal. And those are the ones that can lead to devastating scarring if they're not yeah, treated appropriately. Per- permanent damage. Yeah. Are we talking damage. category one burns there in that case then? Or is that a meaningless uh, way Cat- of Yeah, category of one doesn't. We, we, there used to be a system where we talked about first, second and third degree. Yeah. But now we tend to talk about superficial burns, uh, partial thickness burns and uh, full thickness burns. So that's the way they're categorised according to depth. And with respect to the type of injury, um, so in children, which uh, overall around the globe probably suffer more burns than than adults, um, a lot are due to what we call scald injuries. So that's from hot liquids of some sort, which could be tea or coffee or soup, etc. And fortunately, they're not usually too large. Um, in in the the uh, in the past, we used to have more significant injuries, particularly from things like children either falling into baths or, or you know, too much hot water being put in, which could cause larger and deeper burns. But fortunately, those have, have reduced in number now. But still, the majority of burn injuries in children, and this is true across the globe, tend to be scald injuries. In adults, it's very variable. Um, in high-income societies, like we are here in, in the UK and Europe, etc., um, we see a lot of the more major burn injuries, so the more significant ones. Unfortunately, a lot of those are, are self-inflicted from people who have you know, mental health issues um, or uh, suicide attempts. Um, the other causes of very significant burns can be house fires. And often, unfortunately, those are related to drug and alcohol issues. Um, and then lots of sort of more minor occupational and sort of home DIY injuries. Um, when we talk about poorer countries, then it's slightly different. So in a lot of what we call emerging economies, there's a significant uh, incidence of what we call high voltage electrical injuries. And these are from high voltage electrical burns that come from pylons, etc., cetera, um, in construction work. Um, so that's, and those cause absolutely devastating injuries. Um, and then of course we have, we have conflict as well. Um, and then a lot of uh, injuries related to cooking when cooking is um, done at low level um, and with often with lots of children around um, because it's a high birth rate in a lot of the poorer countries. And so children and hot liquids, hot stoves, hot fires, etc., lead to burn injuries. Um, and then, of course, another thing that people um, I'm sure are aware of is uh, things like acid violence, which is, um, it's it's a devastating injury. It's fortunately, it's not actually that common compared to other injuries, but you know, it's, that's something that happens as well and in interpersonal violence. So an awful lot of things that can cause burn injuries. And then there's the, perhaps the final one, which fortunately, has, has not occurred yet, but is always that threat without wanting to, to sort of worry people. But there is, of course, a risk of nuclear injury as well. Well, I can see now very clearly how there is a, a wider social and economic aspect to your work. Um, and I want to talk about that in a bit as well as further treatments. But I think we need to firstly just hone in on the fact that in your introduction, you mentioned working in all these absolutely fascinating places. Mm-hmm. Um, literally around the world, in some cases quite challenging environments as well, I would imagine. Do you want to just elaborate in some way about you know the places you've worked, perhaps the most interesting places you've worked? Yes. Yeah, so clearly with with uh, my role is in global burn injury. So I've used, as you said, that, that tends to be around the world. And um, as I've, I've mentioned as well, burns is really a, a disease in inverted commas of, of poverty. So it's in the poorest environments and in conflict environments where the number of burn injuries tends to to be the highest. So uh, over my career, I've worked in many, many different countries, um, mostly in in Asia, uh, Africa and the Middle East. Um, Some memorable countries, I guess, uh, would be uh, Afghanistan is a very difficult country to work in. Why? because of the security, basically. So we uh, supported and and hopefully will continue to support, but this is difficult because of the situation there, pediatric burn centre in, in Kabul, in the capital. 
Um, but uh, as I say, it is very, very difficult to to try and get any sustainable change just because of the security background. And that's the same in some other countries, Iraq, for example, um, uh, just because of what's happened there and the, the, the conflict that's been going on there for a very long time means that the services have been disrupted for a, a long time. Um, so there's an, a lot of staff have left. So there's there's less people available to treat burn injuries, and yet there's more injuries because of disrupted electrical supplies, overcrowding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then there's countries like Sierra Leone who have, have, that has come out of a, a long conflict, and then unfortunately followed by another crisis, which was Ebola, which means that you know a country like that is really struggling to to develop basically even though there's a lot of input going there and you know a country like Sierra Leone has incredibly limited resources to to try and treat burn injuries with very very few people that have had any training to deal with these type of injuries so you've got the the resource limitations on top of a, a sort of a lack of trained staff on top of security issues, um, transport issues, access issues. So, you know, in the, in the more difficult countries, all those tend to come together. Have you ever tallied up how many different countries just for work that you've gone to? Uh, not off the top of my head, but it's it's quite a lot. It would be, it would be in the dozens, I guess. Yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. Do you have a favourite? I know your work is very challenging <laughs> and going out there isn't always in the nicest circumstances, yeah. but do you have a, a place that you particularly look forward to going back to? Um, Nepal, I'd say. Yeah, we've been working in Nepal for a long time. Um, it's a lovely country. Uh, the people are wonderful. The environment's fantastic. It's you know, it's a beautiful country. It's um, yeah, I'd, I'd certainly have a lot of good friends there now, and it's great motorbiking country as well. Which I promise we'll come <laughs> on to. I promise. Uh, are you always received well, or is there sometimes some sense of caution or even suspicion about you know this? British man coming in trying to help? Um, well, I'll answer that in two ways. So first of all, we we only will go somewhere where we're invited. So okay. yep. that's a good starting point. And secondly, so the, the work we do at the centre here in Swansea, we work very closely with an organisation um, that in fact I set up many years ago called Interburns, which is the International Network for Training, Education and Research in Burns. So this is an operational organisation that is sort of is a development partner, if you like. And this is what I think makes our work in many ways more robust and sustainable is we have this link between research um, and an academic side provided by the centre and the university and a sort of translation of that into actual practical change on the ground and, and putting evidence if to, into practice, if you like, through working through an operational partner that has that has programs in, in many countries. And so to come to the, the you know the question about one or, or you know a UK inhabitant going to some of these countries, through through the organization that we deliver a lot of this work through, um, most of our membership and most of the people working in that organization actually live and work in the countries that that we work in. So an example would be um, we've run a training program recently in um, in Nepal, let's say, um, which was around trying to deliver um, improvements in the, the actual surgical care of patients based on you know work that has been done in the past. And in that scenario, you know that the faculty delivering that work, um, uh, yes, myself, but also colleagues from uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, India, Afghanistan, Palestine, Ethiopia, Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa. So you can see it's a very, very mixed, geographically mixed, culturally um, team that goes. And, and we always work in that way so that there's slightly less of this sort of north-south type feel to it, which I think is very important. Sure. And I know that you're very keen that what you do involves training um, as well. So do you want to say a little bit more about that aspect of your work and how what you do helps train people as well as just helping, as it were? Yeah. So I think I mean, most of, in terms of the, a lot of the research we do is around what we call in improvement and implementation science and quality improvement and and how to deliver that in these lower resource environments 
And a lot of that then means it's it's really important to train frontline staff. So in many of the countries we work in, as I say, there there's either nobody who's had actual training in, in burn care or very limited numbers. So one of the things to try and build capacity relatively rapidly is to to train people in the, the basics, the essentials of, of management of burn injuries. Um, and if if we look at uh, health services in general, there, there tend to be three sort of levels, if you like, in most countries, which would be considered basic, um, intermediate and advanced. And that's that's sort of replicated in lots of countries, same as we have in the UK. We have basic burn services, which are called burn facilities. We have burn units, which are a bit higher, and then burn centres. Um, and that's, as I say, the same in many countries. So through some of the work we've done, we've developed um, training programs based on on needs assessment and evaluations, et cetera, for the basic level of care. And this is for um, mostly for nurses and primary healthcare workers to manage the more minor burn injuries, so not inpatient care. Um, and that's at the moment being delivered, for example, in, in Nepal, Ethiopia, and the Palestinian territories. And we do training of trainers so that that can rapidly be disseminated. So we just do an initial training to train local staff, and then they deliver that and expand it across the country. And, and what are we talking here? What, what exactly are they delivering? What level of care? So at that, at that primary healthcare level, it's really um, a mixture. So one is teach them about appropriate first aid because there's many, many countries, and this we've done a number of community surveys in, in different countries, which has demonstrated that first aid is, is often inappropriate and can even be harmful. So it's around teaching the basics of first aid. It's around teaching simple management of, of burn injuries. So how to, how to identify the depth of the burn, how to clean the wound, how to dress wounds, how to uh, give advice around elevating limbs, for example, keeping them moving, and how to identify complications and be able then to refer patients early to the appropriate service. So that's the sort of what would cover a basic level. The next level is the intermediate, and that's around, um, it's usually at this level, it's it's looking after patients that have got more serious burn injuries that, that require hospitalisation, um, but usually the staff looking after them have uh, have not had any dedicated or specific burn training. So that goes into a lot more detail. That's more comprehensive. There's specifics around nursing care, around rehabilitation, some basics of surgical management, etc. But at the same time, we also teach the softer skills such as communication, uh, leadership skills, etc. Um, team working, because that's really important in burn care. And then at the highest level, the advanced level. Um, that's for people that have already had some training in burn care. And we, we deliver that in, in different modules. So advanced nursing care, advanced rehabilitation, advanced surgical care, et cetera. And as I say, those are, those are based on, on work um, and development that's been going on over, over 10 plus years or so now. And, and when you say we, um, it's probably best just to sort of take stock here. You're based... Yep. At Swansea University, you're a professor here in the yep. College of Human and Health Sciences, um, but you're obviously on the move mm -hmm. quite a lot. So, what does your what, what's a year in your life like? How often are you here? How often are you away? What what is your what is your specific role now? Um, so now I'm um, at, at the centre here. So we have what is called the Centre for Global Burn Injury Policy and Research. And when was that established? Uh, that was established in 2017. Great. And initially, that it sounds quite grand, a centre. Initially, that was myself, and that's it, <laughs> working <laughs> part time. But because uh, I was still at that stage working clinically in the in the hospital here, and then we were uh, fortunate enough to to receive a grant from the National Institute for Health Research, um, and this was a a substantial grant to allow us to develop a NIHR, National Institute for Health Research, um, global health research group on burn trauma. Um, and within that, there's there's three sort of streams, if you like, of research. One is around looking at capacity building and quality improvement and how to deliver that effectively, what works, what doesn't work. One is more based around prevention activities, and one is based around um, mass casualty burn scenarios and burns in conflict. So those are the sort of three streams, if you like. So to to deliver both the the, the research side, but also the the 
as I've mentioned, capacity building and training in that as well. Um, we have this partnership with, with Interburns, but also with other academic institutes. And we work very closely with the World Health Organization, uh, with a number of uh, NGOs, so non-government organizations such as um, Medical Aid for Palestinians, Médecins Sans Frontières, the International Red Cross, uh, and with other academic institutions such as the American University of Beirut, uh, Johns Hopkins, the George Institute, so a number of other uh, uh, institutes as well. But I mean, coming to a, a sort of what would a, an average, perhaps not working week, but uh, over the last um, six months, say, then I yes, I probably spend at least half of that time away. Um, so in in the in the last six months, um, I've I've had to to visit um, and and work in in Ethiopia, in Gaza, in Palestine, in uh, West Bank, in Nepal, in Sierra Leone. Um, trying to think, well, also sometimes in Europe, also um, to Geneva to for meetings with. Um, the World Health Organization, etc., um, and trying to think which other countries now recently. But yeah, that's that. Well, there's quite a lot yeah. there for six months or so, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and when you say work, what are you doing when you go out there? Are you literally in operating theatres, or is this now more a organisational leadership role that you're performing? So to be honest, it's a mixture. Um, it depends where and when. So uh, last week, for example, I was in Ethiopia and there we were um, delivering the training of the trainers for this basic burn care process so that um, staff then within Ethiopia can deliver that. And their aim is to deliver that training to 200 staff in the next, well, by by the end of March next year. But also we had to have meetings with our, our partner in in um, Ethiopia, which is we work closely with the Federal Ministry of Health. So we had meetings with the Ministry of Health, with uh, the the delivery partner within Ethiopia, which is an organization called AMREF. Um, so we, we had to have sort of catch up meetings, see where we're at, if there are any issues, et cetera. And then we also visited a service in, in Jima, which is in the, the sort of southwest of Ethiopia, to actually, because that's one of the hospitals that we're, we're working with, to actually meet the staff there, to see what's going on there, to to assess whether the evaluation of the service that had been done there was was appropriate and, and um, reliable, and also to then discuss how to move forward. So what the, the next stage and how to look at how things can become more sustainable. Um, so that's a fairly sort of typical um, uh, uh, process. But then there's other, sometimes we're asked specifically to do uh, assessments or evaluations. So last year or sorry, earlier this year, for example, Médecins Sans Frontières asked if it we could help evaluate um, their delivery of burn care in in two services in Iraq, in Mosul, in, in Sinuni. So that involved more um, speaking to staff there, looking at the the what they understood, what they were doing, um, and trying to see whether there any improvements were needed, and if so, how to do those, and and what would be needed, and come out with a strategy. And then in Sierra Leone, for example, it's different again. We were asked by a, an organisation to help develop a strategy really for a national strategy. So that's a much more broader picture where you have to look at not just what the incidence is and, and the etiology or the causes of burn injuries, but also understand how patients are referred, what the referral patterns are, what the what the resources are to deliver burn care, both at, as I say, at basic, intermediate, and advanced levels, the difference between the capital city and the, the rural mm, areas, yeah. how transport and pre-hospital care works, et cetera. So that's that's quite a big piece of work. How do you keep tabs on how things are done so differently in all these different places? You must have to try and compartmentalise everything in a certain way. Um, Yes, I mean, I, I, it is. It's. I mean, you certainly have to keep good notes. For example, so I mean, Sierra Leone was a, a good example. Uh, it was a, a, a more or less a one week visit in in April, I think. But by the time I came to writing the actual final report and the strategy document, because of other work and other trips coming up in between, it, it was probably nearly three months later. And of course, by then, a, a lot of other things have happened and. You know, you can't remember it wasn't yesterday, it was three months ago. So yes. it is important to keep very good notes, that's for sure. 
Um, obviously, you know, I work with a team and uh, we have, um, you know, other staff as well. Um, and I mean, to an extent, although there's there's a lot of differences, the, the processes, if you like, are quite similar. So the, the actual and the, the theory behind it and the theory of change and improvement is quite similar across them, um, but it's just the specific circumstances of each place. What motivates you, you know, when you're at the airport again, flying out somewhere again, what motivates you to keep going and keep doing all of this? Um, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I think for me, there is there is a question of, of a, a sort of higher question, if you like, around justice. And, and in many ways, a, a burn injury and burn patients are, are almost a kind of microcosm. They represent a lot about society, if you like. So it is... The, the I say the poorest patients that that often end up with a burn injury, and often they're neglected because it's not people don't like to work with burn injuries. They're not considered, um, you know, fancy, and and it's people don't know what to do, so they feel a bit threatened and 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 un, unsure. So they kind of ignore the problem. Um, so I guess then it's the the people we actually work with, and the, and the dedication that you do see. In in not clearly not everyone, but you know when you see a really dedicated team, or say the visit last week to this hospital in in southwest uh, Ethiopia, you know a very dedicated team that that really want to try and improve stuff and are really keen to to work together. And the fact that we know from successes we've had that it is possible to improve care. And we worked over 14 services in Nepal and Bangladesh over a number of years. And we've looked at those programs from the point of view of quality improvement and capacity building. And, and all 14 services, you know, did improve. Now, these are not dramatic, you know, huge changes because that's just not possible in such a complex area. But it's important that things are going in the right direction. Um, and often when I talk to people, I say this, these changes may not affect you. They may not affect your children, but hopefully they'll affect your grandchildren because mm. it is a long process. And something you said there reminded me that I'd, I'd read something you said earlier uh, about how this was, your work was about obviously much more than just a medical issue. It was about equality and justice. Mm -hmm. So this is, this really is a mission for you, isn't it? Um, yes, I'm not sure I'd use the term mission, but uh, yes, it's a, it's, it's something that I feel very passionate about. Yeah. Um, and as I say that the, the number of, of colleagues that I have now across the globe who, who hopefully feel in a similar way. Um, so it is almost a, a movement, I guess you could say, to try and to try and do something about what what the WHO has described as a you know a public health crisis. Burn injuries are in many countries not decreasing at all. So it's, it's this inequity between the higher income countries and the lower income countries, where uh, you know nobody in the UK would accept some of the outcomes that I see on a regular basis in, in poorer countries. And are they not decreasing because there's because it's still about that low level cooking aspect or is it because actually they are setting up industries and these are more workplace industry um, injuries like you were outlining at the start? Um, I mean, it's a mixture. It depends which country you're in. Um, there's, there's, I mean, one of the, the issues around burn injuries, say, is, is the, the the poverty issue, and if you look at countries, what what we can do, and what society can do, and what research and clinical care can do, to an extent, is 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 never going to fundamentally change things. And where you see burn injuries decrease, um, it comes along with development of that country, and meaning economic development and social development higher educational levels, et cetera, that's actually, those are the underlying changes that will reduce the number of burn injuries. And I mean, I can give a specific example of that. Mm, please. Years ago, um, we did a short, a small research program in India um, in rural villages exchanging kerosene lamps, which cause a lot of burn injuries, for solar-powered lamps. And we looked at the outcomes, and over the course of a year, the number of injuries decreased. Uh, which was obviously very promising, and people were using these lamps. Um, 
So we thought, well, this is great. You know, we exchanged, if, if that was scaled up across the country, wouldn't that be fantastic? Several years later, uh, my colleague in India went back to the same rural villages to, to sort of do some follow up in the longer term. And what was interesting is they were no longer using the solar lamps, but the number of burn injuries was still low, and if anything, had dropped even lower. And the simple reason being that those villages now had an electrical supply. So they no longer needed either kerosene or solar lamps. And that's development. Yeah. Lots of issues swirling around here to, to deal with. Here. Um, after all this time, are you still shocked by some of the things you see? Um, probably not shocked, but disappointed. Okay. Why? Um, I think sometimes you see, for me, if I see, um, again, an example would perhaps help here. In in uh, a few years back in Bangladesh, um, we'd been working with, with colleagues there doing some training. And one of the things that came out was a little bit, oh, well, we, we know this. We don't really need this. And then I went with um, one of my uh, partners, Indian, uh, that we're working with there to go to look at the ward and the patients. And uh, we even got laughed at when we washed our hands as if that's sort of like, you know, mm. we don't need to do that. We don't do that. And you looked around and without going into the, the sort of specifics of individual cases or anything, but the issue was not so much resource. So on the one hand, you have people saying, oh, we, we know what to do here, uh, which if that's the case, fine, but there's a very big gap between knowledge and action. And that's that's really the fundamental ethos of our all our research really is looking at how you put knowledge into action. So people may know how to do stuff, but for various and, and often complex reasons, which touch across psychology, culture and everything, they're not actually doing it. So you can look at the resources, for example, and, and fairly simply say, well, actually, if you utilize these resources without getting any more, but just what you've got in a more appropriate manner, you'd be able to achieve better outcomes. And it's that, so I said, it's a disappointment, if you like, that still even now, burn patients tend to be neglected, you know, and that still we can see in many, many places we go to that they are the most neglected patients in services. And the most tragic, of course, is, is when it's children. And they do represent probably globally 70% of injuries. And unfortunately, when they have deeper injuries that are not treated appropriately, the disability and the deformity that can result is horrific, you know, and can leave them and does leave them disabled for for the whole of you know the rest of their lives and it is preventable yeah you know, it is absolutely preventable it really strikes me that everything that you're talking about is to put it crudely a fusing of medical things or scientific things and politics i guess and it's particularly about policy and it's about strategy um that's not always clear cut and easy, is it, when the two things meet? So have you ever encountered any difficulties or problems about taking something that fundamentally is about medicine and about treating burn patients, but also doing it with, you know, yes, non-governmental organisations, but you know, ex external organisations nonetheless, and just dealing with, you know, like we've talked about equality, justice. What happens when science and politics meets like this? Well, it's quite complex, I think, as as you've yeah. hence, expressed. That's my long. That's my long question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, and you're absolutely right. It is. It is a political issue um, for those very reasons. It's an issue about poverty, about equity, um, and equality. It's about access, um, and it can be. You have to tread quite carefully, um, and. You know, we 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 mustn't also forget the the what happens, which happens in every country in the world. So this is not something that's unique to you know low income countries or anything. But we know in every country in the world, and we only need to look at some scandals that have you know happened in the UK that there is also corruption. Yes, um, and 
without naming any particular countries, but, you know, I have been to services where there's an intensive care unit for burn care and the patients in that intensive care unit are not in there because they require intensive care. They're in there because they can afford it, um, because they can pay more money and perhaps get slightly better treatment, but they don't actually need it. Whereas some of the patients that do need it and unfortunately don't have access because they cannot afford it. But we have to also be quite, uh, in, in some ways, I, I guess, hard hearted that there is, you know, there is absolutely an issue with funding as well. And burn care is, is not cheap. Now, I think we have demonstrated through the work we've done over the last 10 years or so that you can provide affordable, effective burn care. Um, once you start getting into more severe injuries, it does become expensive. Um, you know, to manage a major burn injury in the UK would cost more than the budget for a whole hospital for a year in some countries. I understand. So, you know, that that is an, an issue as well. As I say, the issue of, of corruption is something that... If you ignore it, when when we look at, say, part of our research looks at um, what's called the, the, an implementation framework. So we, we use um, a scientific framework to look at what the barriers are and the facilitators to implementing change. So something quite simple like washing hands, for example. We know, we know say, in, in all countries around the world, hand washing in a clinical environment is not as it should be. So we're not achieving 100% compliance. So a very sort of simplistic view to that is, well, you know, we'll just tell people or we'll stick a poster up over the over the wash basin saying, wash your hands or a poster on the door. You know, that's a very simplistic way, but there's a whole science looking at looking at this called implementation science. And you look at, at the sort of the, what's called the inner setting, the outer setting, you look at the process, you look at the intervention, you look at the characters involved. And this gives a much, much more complex picture of, of why these things don't happen. And there's a, 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 another framework that looks at knowledge to action. And, um, you know, it helps understand, is it, are people aware? Do they, you know, are they aware that they're supposed to do it? That's, that's the first point. If they're not aware, well, you can't expect that they're going to, in this case, wash their hands. Do they agree with it? So they may be aware of it, but just not agree with the evidence. So that's a different approach. You know, do they accept it? Do they adhere to it, et cetera? So there's different ways of approaching it. And unless we take that, that's a rigorous scientific approach, we'll keep going back to the repeating the same errors, if you like. So, uh, you know, ignoring something like corruption mm. is, is it's not, you know, we, we have to just accept it, that that exists. And so what are the ways to, to overcome or to, to deal with that as well? Like you say, be quite hard nosed about it sometimes. Mm. Must be must be troubling for you occasionally though thinking that you're dealing in these quite well very imperfect environments but it's but i suppose the work is is, is worth doing regardless yes i mean i you know to be honest i think if we we look across most things you know most things are not are not perfect and and uh, you know there's there's in the medical field for example you, you could take anything the, the inequalities exist there across the globe you know cancer outcomes Across the UK, very considerably. Across the globe, very enormously. Outcomes from trauma, outcomes from, you know, infectious diseases. So you can't you can't extract, if you like, health and politics. They are they're intrinsically bound up. One more thing about your research. I've seen in the past that you've talked about a need for a shift in thinking, and you said uh, that we need to move from experiments to in improvements in science. Now, I'm sure you've probably talked about what you meant there quite a lot already here, but could you just summarise what that means? Because I was intrigued about this idea of moving away from experiments. Mm. So again, using Burns as an example, if, if the reality is we actually know how to treat burn injuries very well. Mm. So over the last 50 years um, in, in higher resource countries, the incidence has dropped significantly. So the, the implication being there is we know how or things have happened 
that have meant the number of people sustaining a burned injury has gone down. And that's due to a whole number of things. That's due to legislation, education, public awareness, environmental manipulation, etc. Um, and we also have significantly improved the survival rates and the outcomes. So in other words, we, we actually know how to treat burns to a pretty high standard. So really, we, if, if we wanted to have the biggest impact on burn injuries on this planet, it's not to, to sort of finesse, if you like, the more, the more severe and extreme examples or try and get even better results, which of course, you know, on one side, but again, if we come to an equality, actually what we want to do is to be able to implement what we know works, but across the whole globe, as opposed to in just isolated parts of the world. So am I being too crude to summarise your point there by saying that it's better to improve care in other countries than make than to make the smaller improvements that would make care better, say, for example, in this country? Yeah, I mean, this, this, this comes down to philosophy. <laughs> you know, this comes down to John Stuart Mill and yeah, you know, yeah. the greater good for all. Yeah. Uh, but these are, these are issues that society has to face. So uh, a manager of a hospital and, you know, the, the government and the Ministry of Health, they have to decide, for example, do we invest in extremely expensive drugs that perhaps can allow somebody with advanced cancer to live a few more months, but at the cost of providing something else. So there is, you know, the, the, the maths is simple, if you like. It's there is a limited amount of resource. It's how does society decide it wants to spend that resource, which brings us back to politics. Indeed. Well, and like you say, philosophical questions yeah. to the core there. Uh, Something that isn't philosophical, but which we do have to talk about and will probably be the final point, is this motorcycle trip of mm -hmm. yours, yeah. uh, the fundraising trip from Nepal to Bangladesh. Sounds amazing. Tell us about it. So uh, this was back in 2014. Um, basically, we're thinking, well, is there a way we can try and raise a bit more awareness about about what's going on in, in the world with burn injuries? And had a number of ideas. And then I just thought, well, why not? Um, why not do a motorcycle trip and make a film of it, a documentary, and visit some of the services that we've worked in over the years? And because we've worked a lot in Nepal and and Bangladesh and India, it seemed also with time restrictions, we didn't you know have a huge amount of time. Uh, it's it seemed that it looked on the on the map, if you like, that it, it should take about. 10, 12 days to drive from, from Kathmandu to, to Dhaka. Um, and I have to admit, I envisaged it's about 1,200 miles, 1,400 miles. So, you know, I was thinking, well, if we do 40 miles an hour, you know, three hours three hours driving a day and then lunchtime, sit down, mm -hmm. relax, enjoy the view. Unfortunately, it didn't work out like that at all. Yeah, we, what, are, what are the roads like? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so it's um, some better than others, and this was this was with um, so it was two families: myself, my wife, and our two children, who at the time were uh, let's think, with fourteen, I think, and uh, can't remember 10, 11, something like that, um, and another family, a friend who's a, a, a does similar work and um, is a, a pediatric plastic surgeon from from Liverpool, and uh, her husband and her two children, who were roughly the same age. And uh, a, a, a an independent sort of filmmaker who who came with us, um, and and filmed it all and made this documentary um, for free. In fact, and it, it was a very I mean it was it was a wonderful trip to do with the the children. They my kids already knew India because we'd spent um, they'd lived there for three months and went to school there when I was working in a in a burn service uh, in in two thousand and eleven. Um, so they they weren't sort of phased by it at all, but it it was interesting and where we ended up so we left um we presented at a meeting that that was going on in Kathmandu at the time unfortunately when we got to the Bangladesh border we after nine hours of the sort of hassle and, and waiting and trying to persuade them to allow us to take the bikes across um they wouldn't allow us because they were they were 500 cc bikes and they don't allow that 
size of bike across the border. So the last day or, or four hours or so we had to do in a, in a minibus. Um, and then we we went to the burn service in, in Dhaka, which we've worked at for many years. And, uh, you know, that is quite a phenomenal place. It's probably one of the biggest burn services in the world. Um, it has, or at the time it had a hundred beds for burn patients, but it often had three to 400 patients in. So as you can imagine, many patients on the floor, in the corridors. So, I mean, a real, a real, um, uh, example of, of what happens when you don't have the capacity, sure. when you don't have prevention, et cetera. Um, so we tried not to make the film, you know, it wasn't gory or anything, but we tried to just to show, you know, to show some of the places we're working in, uh, raise some awareness about that as well, um, and then also introduce the the kids to to some of the stuff we do. It all sounds fascinating, and we are going to have to leave it there, I'm afraid. Uh, but if you'd like to find out more about Professor Tom Potoka's work, then visit the globalburns.org forward slash research and the interburns.org websites. To find out more about this podcast and Swansea University's research, visit swansea.ac.uk forward slash research. So that's all for us today. Thank you for listening and thank you again to our guest, Professor Tom Potoka. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate and review. I'm Sam Blacksland and that was Exploring Global Problems from Swansea University.